Hi, I'm Max Pilesho and I'm Technical Director with Theos Genomics. Today I'm going to talk a bit about biomarkers and the role of bioinformatics in supporting the biomarker discovery and validation processes. But first, I will give a quick introduction to Theos, the company that I represent. We are a bioinformatics service provider where we provide services to research projects within pharma, biotech, CROs and academia. We have helped support a wide range of projects, all the way from preclinical work to phase three clinical trials, with our focus on biological interpretation and underpinned by our visual and interactive reporting platform. We originally spun out of Edinburgh University back in 2008, and we are now based in the Edinburgh BioQuarter since 2012. One of the main drivers behind the current biomarker discovery approaches come from the rapid development of molecular data, so-called omics data, for instance, gene expression or proteomics data. The technological advances have opened up a multitude of avenues in biomarker identification and patient stratification. However, these advances have also created some unexpected issues. The sheer volume of data can be challenging to store and to transfer and will require big data repositories and cloud storage to handle. The outputs from the instruments are also not necessarily in an interpretation ready format when they are produced. For instance, a typical next generation sequencing data will create billions of data points they will need heavy pre-processing to end up in a manageable form. The data also tends to end up in several potential locations, which is typically different for each type of data, for instance, transcriptomic and proteomic data. And there are often numerous places to look even for the same platform. Unless you have extensive experience in the field, it can be challenging to know where to go to look for a certain type of data. Where is the best place to look to find relevant biomarkers? Should I pick gene expression data, proteomics, metabolomics, methylation? All of this requires in-depth knowledge of both the strengths and weaknesses of the platforms, as well as the mechanisms of disease of interest. All of these are areas where experience of the whole process from data generations to data analysis is essential. At Fios Genomics, we made an early decision to be platform agnostic, so we're not limited to a particular type of data or platform. We can analyze and have analyzed data from virtually all kinds of platforms. The grid on the right shows a few examples. In order to be platform agnostic, we rely on our modular workflows, which enables us to quickly work through standard analysis sections while giving us the flexibility to add bespoke elements which are commonly required during analysis. The workflows are also integrated into our dynamic and interactive reporting format, which is the primary output from our analysis. This is centered around a self-reporting approach so that analysis steps and reporting go hand in hand. I'll use a simple example of a typical RNA-seq workflow to begin with. At the start, the RNA-seq data is processed through computationally intense workflows, which may require cloud computing to generate read counts. This is followed by a series of quality control steps. At FIOS, we look at read quality, alignment quality, as well as a general data QC to evaluate outliers and patterns in the dataset. Once we're happy with the quality, in most cases, there is a statistical analysis to identify differentially expressed genes, which generates a gene list. That's where a lot of people would stop. For us, however, that's only the beginning of the analysis. From a gene list, you can follow up with network and pathway analysis to better understand what pathways and processes those genes are involved in. You can pull in additional data from external sources and integrate, for instance, clinical or demographical data. There is also a possibility of more exploratory approaches, for instance, clustering of data to understand the presence of unexplained or explained subgroups in the data. 
All of this will be interpreted by a team of expert bioinformaticians with a biological focus and presented with interpretable visualization and an interactive reporting infrastructure. That was a very high level example. I will now move over to a more in-depth oncology case study. This study, which was published last year together with Genentech, is focused on understanding the role of the immune system in the progression of triple negative breast cancer from primary to metastatic disease. While authorship is not something that we asked for, we were offered authorship following our in-depth involvement in the project and we were of course more than happy to accept that. First, a bit of background to the study. Triple negative breast cancer or TNBC is an aggressive form of breast cancer that lacks estrogen and progesterone receptors and has excess levels of HER2. Approximately 15% of breast cancers are classified as TNBC. Due to the lack of receptors, TNBC does not respond to hormonal therapy or treatments targeting HER2, with cytotoxic chemotherapy being the standard of care. More recently, immune checkpoint inhibitors, such as atezolizumab, have been approved for first-line treatment. Immune checkpoint inhibitors aim to disable the immune defense of the tumor to allow host immune cells to attack. Recent studies have shown that immune checkpoint inhibitors have reduced efficacy in heavily pretreated TNBC. However, it's unclear at a molecular level why that is the case. The primary aim of the study is to evaluate the phenotypic changes of TNBCs with a particular focus on immunomodulatory signatures. In order to assess the study aims, paired primary and metastatic samples have been collected for 43 patients with recurrent TNBC from a biorepository. The samples were profiled with targeted sequencing using the FMI platform and whole transcriptome sequencing using RNA-seq. Alongside the sequencing data, there was also clinical and demographical data as well as other outputs. The study incorporated an integration of all of these outputs, for instance, somatic mutation profile, tumor mutational burden, molecular subtype classification, stromal TILs, recurrence-free survival, and overall survival. The initial part of the analysis was focused on the somatic mutations. 34 TMBC pairs, or 68 samples, were sequenced using the Foundation 1 targeted assay. The platform identifies selected base substitutions, insertions and deletions, amplifications and rearrangements. The results are summarized in the oncoplot on the right, which lists the mutations ordered by the most frequently mutated genes and with the paired samples next to each other. The tumor mutational burden, which is a summary score of all mutations for each patient, is also shown at the top of the plot. The most common mutations in line with the majority of cancer studies were P53, MIC, PIK3CA, and P10. From statistical analysis, no significant mutational or tumor mutational burden changes were observed between the primary and metastatic samples. While the oncoplot gives an overview of the results, a more focused analysis of the paired primary metastatic mutations is required to better understand the concordance. The plot on the right shows the mutations by patient outlining mutations that are unique to the primary sample, unique to the metastatic sample, and shared between the pairs. The majority of mutations were shared between pairs. Since they are consistent, they cannot explain the phenotypic differences between the primary and metastatic samples. A smaller proportion of mutations are unique to either the primary or metastatic sample, which are generally of interest in this case. However, these tended to be patient-specific with no common trend across the cohort. We therefore concluded that there were no consistent mutational shifts that could explain the phenotypic differences in primary to metastatic samples. One common measure of immune status in solid tumors is the level of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or TILs. These were measured using histopathology-derived techniques 
from the stroma which is surrounding the tumors. As shown in the middle box plot, there is a significant decrease in stromal tilts in the metastatic samples compared to the primary samples. We can also dichotomize the till levels, high and low, and look at associations with survival, using overall survival in this case. This is illustrated on the right in the Kaplan-Meier plot, showing high stromal till levels in blue and low stromal till levels in red. While there is a trend that high stromal tilts in blue tends to have more favorable survival, it is only indicative and not supported by statistical tests. As part of the study, RNA-seq data was also generated, capturing gene expression levels from 35 paired primary metastatic samples. The data was processed, QC checked, and normalized, followed by statistical analysis to evaluate differences between the two paired groups. The results are summarized in the volcano plot. The relative fold changes are shown on the horizontal axis, with genes higher in metastatic samples on the right in red, while those that are decreasing in the metastatic samples are on the left in blue. The vertical axis shows the significance as inverted p-values, so significance is highest at the top of the plot. In total, around a thousand genes were significantly differentially expressed at a standard p-value cutoff of less than 0 0.05 with FDR correction. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that generating gene lists is normally just a starting point for an analysis of this type. The main question that we wanted to answer is what those thousand genes are involved in and how they may be relevant to the study background. One of the approaches to that is by using pathway analysis where we look for overrepresentation of genes involved in certain pathways or processes. The bar charts here show pathway analysis outputs from the KEG database. The outputs are presented so that longer bars denote more significant enrichment of a certain pathway and split so that genes that have increased expression in metastatic samples are in red to the left and those that have decreased expression are shown in blue to the right. A notable observation here is that all of the top pathways in the downregulated genes in metastatic samples, shown in blue, are directly related to immunological pathways. This is a clear indication that genes involved in immune pathways are generally suppressed in the metastatic samples compared to their paired primary sample. At this point, there are several ways you can start digging deeper into the involvement of immune genes. One way is to look at the immune subtype classifications. These immune subtypes are classified based on a composite score of expression from relevant immune genes. There are several possible subtype classification schemes, of which several were evaluated in the paper. The one illustrated here is the Burstein subtypes, which is categorized into basal-like immune activated, basal-like immune suppressed, mesenchymal and luminal androgen receptor subgroups. Since we have paired data, it is possible to follow the fate of each patient from primary to metastatic in the context of its subtypes, which is shown in the alluvial plot. To the left of the plot is the primary samples stacked on top of each other, and to the right is the corresponding metastatic samples which are connected by lines. The most striking result from this plot is that a considerable amount of patients start with an immune-activated classification in red, but move to the immune-suppressed subgroup in blue in the metastatic samples. We also looked at four additional expression scores from previous publications. In the box plot on the right, the relative score from each of these gene signatures is shown with the primary and metastatic samples shown next to each other. The high-level interpretation is that higher scores imply higher immune involvement. The pattern is again clear in that for all signatures, there is a significant decrease in the immune signatures in metastatic samples compared to primary samples. The data presented in this study is from bulk RNA-seq data which is capturing the expression of millions of cells. While it's not a substitute for single-cell resolution data, 
there has been a lot of research and interest in trying to isolate the contribution of individual cells from this type of data using in silico approaches. This type of approach is called cell deconvolution. The results from a cell deconvolution analysis of the expression data shows relative proportions of certain immune cell types in the heat map on the right. When you contrast them side by side, the metastatic samples have a significant decrease in proportions of various immune cells, including B cells, naive CD4 positive T cells, and CD8 positive T cells. To summarize, in this case study, we used omics data and bioinformatics analysis to look at the immune landscape in primary versus metastatic TMBC samples. With the intention of better understanding the mechanisms involved in the reduced efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitors in heavily pretreated TMBCs. At the mutational level, there were some mutational changes, but no consistent mutational shifts in longitudinally paired TMBCs. This suggests that there are no common mutational patterns explaining the differences in primary versus metastatic samples. Stromal tails surrounding the tumor are however significantly decreased in metastatic samples. And from the transcriptomic analysis, immune activating gene expression signatures are significantly reduced in the recurrent metastatic TMBC samples. Further studies are ongoing to supplement these initial findings. This is one example of our published work, which is described in detail in the paper if you want to take a closer look. Plenty more publications are also available at our website together with other resources, including case studies, white papers, and blog posts. I'm happy to take any additional questions at the Q&A session later on, or please come up to our booth to hear more. Thank you very much for listening.